Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 528. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because we are going to take a trip down memory lane. And more importantly, we're going to take a trip down a type of real estate that we often don't talk about here. Uh, when it comes down to it, though, we're all out there looking to build our cash flow. We we have a place where, you know, you get up, you go to work, maybe you work at your home, maybe you actually are building your business in a, you know, in a office or maybe you're doing some co-working but ultimately when it comes to the real estate world it, we all need a place to live work play or lay and that's exactly what it comes down to but today's guest has been doing real estate for quite some time and by quite some time i mean 62 years with that being said you're probably wondering who are we talking about well today i have with me none other than welcome wilson senior uh, and he uh, is the chairman of the board of the Welcome Group, and they tend to specialize in manufacturing and other industrial facilities in Texas and currently comprise over 4 million square feet of space. Now, the story is great. The history is huge. The lessons are deep. And as he himself would say, uh, he has had the privilege of doing so much work for so many years, I, I can't imagine what you and I are all about to learn. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to make some time. We're going to be ready with that pause button and hitting that note so that you can take some notes because we're going to learn lots of lessons about how to build our own business as we listen to Welcome Wilson Sr. Welcome. How are you doing? Done, done fine, thanks. I... I appreciate you taking the time to be here. It means a lot. Now, this being the first time that you're here, I have to ask you the same question I tend to ask everybody else. Are you ready? Yes. All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, like Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, etc., because I tend to think that entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. For example... If you think about, uh, as an entrepreneur, occasionally I can envision myself wandering around town, using our products and services, and saving our customers one sale at a time. And occasionally, yes, I'm probably wearing a cape at that moment. Also, though, like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning. For example, if you think about Spider-Man, there was a time where he was just a kid going to school, doing his thing, and then, you know, taking some photos. But one day he gets bit by a spider, discovers that he has a superhuman ability, and now he has to choose whether to use this ability for good or for evil. So, my question to you is as follows. Before forming the Welcome Group, before even serving in, in, in the Korean War, before, uh, you know, working with the likes of uh, pres uh, former President Eisenhower and Kennedy, before doing all the things that you have done, what we want to know is, who is Welcome, Wilson. Well, the uh, I've had about six life-changing conversations in my life. Mm. <clears throat> and the first one was with my father when I was 17, and I thought I was going into the Army during mm. World War II. Mm. And I... Uh, <clears throat> He said, in order to succeed in business, you've got to have guts and determination. Now, he didn't mean the guts to get into a fight. Mm -hmm. He meant the guts to make a pitch 
to hmm. make a pitch to somebody you've never met that's highly in your favor, be able to keep a straight fa- face and uh, and look them in the eye. And I would say that that one talent has served me well for many, many, many years. <laughs> Got it. So do you, I'm, I'm just curious, what was it like the the first time you tried to make such a pitch? Do you <laughs> were you excited, nervous? Was Dad's words running through your head? Well, the uh, yes, uh, he he felt like. Being a salesman was the highest calling. Really? Yes, because if you're a salesman, you can always get a job. Hmm. You can always get a job. The first significant pitch I made in business was when I talked to a multimillionaire who I barely knew into buying to spending several hundred thousand dollars in cash to buy 300 acres of land in Galveston, Texas, and then turn around and sell it to me for a dollar down. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> with payments every time I sold something. So, uh, and it wasn't, the pitch was not easy and uh, it took me I guess a year to get him to do it. Wow. And then I made a pitch that I needed to put in streets and utilities because we were putting in a subdivision. So I talked him into guaranteeing my note for $250,000 unsecured at the National Bank of Commerce in Houston. And uh, <clears throat> he signed the back of the note and they did not, the bank did not even ask me for a financial statement. Hmm. Wow. But uh, I would say that that's one of the more significant pitches I made. They but, uh, both were successful. So let me ask you this question then. There's a number of people who are listening who they're not asking anywhere near as much as you just, you know, Said that they're not asking for investors to commit anywhere near as much. They're not asking for buyers to commit anywhere near as much. But yet, I know that they're having some challenges opening their mouth and actually getting those words out. Uh, they're probably wondering where did the courage come from for you to to do such a thing. Well, from my father, uh, my father just convinced me that uh, that I needed to be able to do that. And and uh, I graduated from the Brownsville Junior College in 1944. And then uh, take it back, 1946. And I, I came to the University of Houston. Mm-hmm. Well, my father believed in self-reliance. Mm. <clears throat> so here's what he told my brother and me when he dropped us off at a Army surplus house trailer, which was the only student housing at the time at the University of Houston, and uh, no bathroom. And he said, boys, I paid your first semester's tuition. I paid your first month's rent on this (laughs) house trailer, 10 bucks. And here's $50 each. And whenever you boys need anything, just call me up on the phone. Whatever you need, you need, call me up on the phone and I'll explain how you can get by without it. <laughs> oh, yes. We never heard from him financially the rest of our lives. And the point is, I was 18 years old. My brother was uh, 20. I got a job at... Uh, selling advertising for the student newspaper at the University of Houston. Uh, And uh, I scrambled uh, a lot. (laughs) We Mm. didn't eat very well, but we made it. And we became self-reliant. 
Wow. So you from that state, how, why? I, and, and I'm curious. I mean, there there were lots of things that you have done, uh, you know, in your career and in your lifetime. Why does real estate, why did real estate make sense to you? At first, I was going in to the oil business. Okay. That almost makes sense coming from, you know, Houston. <laughs> but I was going to, I wasn't going to look for a job. I was going to be the op- operator. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Bob Smith, the oil man in Houston, and he was the one who made the loan for Jamaica Beach. Got it. That I mentioned. Uh, Bob Smith came to me and said, or called me in, and said, "Look, the I, I think the oil business is over for the independent." He said, "These drill, these wells cost thirty, forty thousand dollars each to drill." Mm. And he said, "An independent just can't raise that kind of money." Well, he was wrong, as T. Boone Pickens proved. Mm-hmm. Uh, the master limited partnerships and all the kind of other, other kinds of financing. But anyway, so he thought I would go in the real estate business. He was the largest landowner in Harris County, which is Houston. And uh, he had about 30,000 acres, including some very, very valuable land. It's now called both sides of the West Belt and the best of both sides of the West Loop in Houston. So he convinced me to go to become a real estate, to go into in real estate. Now, he didn't want me to be a developer. He wanted me to be an investor. Hmm. But if you have no money, <laughs> <laughs> you can't be an investor. So uh, I became a developer. So... Uh- I'm hearing a a trend of you. It sounds like either you're seeking out advice or people are voluntarily giving you advice and you keep following it. Is this something that has uh, earmarked your career? You seeking out individuals and and asking them their thoughts on what you should do next? Not really. Uh, I was listening to him because he had all the money. (laughs) <laughs> that, that totally understood and and also he was I worked for him at the time and uh, he was the 800 pound gorilla got it got it so I, I think many would say today that you're one of those 800 pound gorillas what would you say to that well probably so I don't feel like one by the way, I have never met anybody who was an entrepreneur that ever thought they were rich. Really? That makes me feel better because I, that, that that is definitely <laughs> I, not how I feel. And it's it's interesting that you say that because there, there can be this thought process that you, you should feel that way at some point. No, the, uh, it doesn't happen. Uh, My company is now worth $77 million. And uh, we know, I know because we just bought in a new partner and that was the valuation put on Mm -hmm. my equity in my company. But, uh, but an entrepreneur never thinks he's rich. And that is my experience. For example, Mm -hmm. uh, I know, five or six billionaires in Houston. Yeah. And uh, so there's always somebody that has more money. <laughs> this is this is true. This is true. Let me ask you this question, because I know there's a number of entrepreneurs who are looking to, to change their station. And coming from uh, a place that you're describing where, you know, your dad is paying <laughs> for one month of rent and just the situation that you're describing. Do you think it was an advantage that you uh, did not already inherit or come from a family that had any sort of means, so to speak? Well, you learn from scrambling. Mm-hmm. And I've been scrambling all my life. So uh, I would say the the necessity for scrambling 
uh, made a contribution in my situation. So what is it? I mean, and be, and I'm asking partly for myself and also because, you know, you've already been through this. Uh, I, I look at my children, uh, you know, they're age 22 down to eight right now. I have four. And I think I, very similarly to you, I think, you know, having to fight for things and not having them handed to me is is kind of important but uh, to the process but I and I don't want to handicap them but at the same time I don't want them to feel like I don't care or I have abandoned them or I'm not helping them in some way how did you handle that with your children well the uh I paid for everything so I, I did not carry on my father's legacy. <laughs> and uh, my two sons are in the business with me. Mm-hmm. They're my partners now. And the company is actually owned by some trusts that I set up about 25 years ago. That, that benefit my wife and five kids. Got it. Interesting. Interesting. Totally understood. Now, when you got into real estate and and developing, I mean, some would say that if you're going to do real estate, that that's probably one of the riskiest plays, um, simple because it's very speculative over time. Uh, I'm curious to know, like, there were there's been a couple of downturns (laughs) during your career. Uh, and I know that there are some investors who are facing a potential downturn or feel like a downturn is coming in some way, shape, or form. What advice would you give someone who's either A, buying and holding real estate, or flipping real estate, or building real estate, um, if they're anticipating a downturn? I used to be in the apartment business. Mm -hmm. I, I built six apartment projects over about three or four years and uh and they're still standing and and one of them is a 100 percent occupied and it's been that way 50 years wow but i I don't own it anymore that's why we never sell anything anymore (laughs) because I, i have nothing to show for it the mortgage would have been paid off twice but it always seemed that i started construction of an apartment project in a boom and opened in a bust (laughs) where it's it seems that way so what lessons would you say you've learned in that and in that situation of just either how to prepare for it like knowing let's pretend that you that that was happening right now you were building an apartment complex and you you're thinking okay we're going to be opening and, and, and it's going to be in the middle of a bust. What would you do knowing what you know to prepare for that? Well, first place, I would bring in some partners that had some money. And uh, <clears throat> my first apartment project, I wanted a, a mortgage expert, a operations expert, a promotions expert, and uh, others. So mm-hmm. I divided the, we had eight partners. Equal, each person had one eighth of the ownership. Mm-hmm. Well, when the contractor went busted during construction, mm. and I'm out there every Friday writing checks to subcontractors. Nobody was with me. So I learned that if if somebody only owns 12.5%, they're not going to be willing to write big checks when you need it. So uh, for, for that reason, only have partners that have enough at stake where uh, success is important to them. Well, I I, I think that's important. I, I've often told and, and, and counseled some of our students and customers that, you know, 
it, partnerships are challenging or can be challenging. And one of the reasons I, I do very, very few of them is because the, the, you know, the cap table, the risk is lopsided because simply because of, you know, where, where someone might be in, in their journey, et cetera. My, so how did you learn to find partners who, that you could work with and become the welcome group you are today? All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. And I'm glad that you are enjoying what you are hearing thus far. But here's one of the things that's really important. One of the most important things that you can do as get started. One of the things that I've said before, and I say again, once you get started, stay started. But more importantly, there can be lots of roadblocks to getting started. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove one of those roadblocks for you and make it a little bit easier because the thing that I don't want to stop you is thinking do I need a local number how about a long distance number or should it be 800 how on earth am I going to make that happen so that people can contact me as I'm out there building my business making my cash flow grow but most importantly understanding that it doesn't have to be difficult many of you may know but if you don't there's a company out there by the name of Grasshopper. And what I want you to do is I want you to go over to trygrasshopper.com forward slash cash flow diary. Grasshopper is the entrepreneur's phone system. It works like a traditional phone system, but requires no hardware to purchase, no software to install. It's just the number that flat works. So if you are out there building that distributed workforce across many different locations, it's a way for you to still go out there and make your number be unified, simple, easy to use, something we've been using for quite some time. So again, go over to trygrasshopper.com forward slash cash flow diary. Now let's get back to the rest of the story. Well, the uh, first place of the ones who did not perform, I just bought out for some nominal amount and uh, like $10,000 or something. Uh, And they were happy to sell. (laughs) <laughs> uh, got it the, so I but I learned that you've got to have partners that uh, that have a, enough stake in your situation that you can rely on them hmm. so if you were approaching a transaction today when you say enough stake what does that look like Well, we just had a a company from New York invest $300 million in our company. Mm -hmm. And and certainly they have a a big stake and uh, they'll they'll bring bring our portfolio up to a billion dollars in value. Right now it's about uh, 450 million. But uh, this will bring it to a billion dollars in value. And you have to have a billion dollars worth of real estate in order to get respect in America. (laughs) That's funny to hear you say that, because I know many people listening right now, um, you you have their respect, sir, (laughs) without having a billion dollars of real estate. So but uh, I I got that. So when it comes down to it, if you I, and I'm just curious, if you were talking to someone getting started today who was wanting to build a, a real estate portfolio or was wanting to become, uh, you know, something more for their family the way that you have. Is there something in in today's economy that you think gives them an advantage um, or is it still guts and determination is what it's going to take? Well, they have many advantages today. For example, when I first got in the business, banks were reluctant to make a loan on raw land. Hmm. <clears throat> and uh, it was unheard of for a bank to make a loan on raw land. So, uh, the uh, and now, of course, banks uh, are happy to make the loan. So I would say it should be easier today than it was in my time because banks are always there looking for business. And right now, the the banks are coming around. 
I'll never forget during what some downturn, the bank turned down my loan and they said, don't worry, welcome. Uh, as soon as this recession is over, we'll be around kissing your ass again, trying to get your business. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it does feel that way that when you need the money, the banks won't give it to you. Yeah. Uh, let, let me tell you a story about cash flow. Yes, please. In the 1960s, it took uh, $20,000 a day to keep my company run rolling. An extra $20,000 a day. So every day I had to raise $20,000 to keep the company going. And uh, so one day I was at the health club, the president's health club in downtown Houston. And I bumped into a friend of mine who was president of Brown and Root. Brown and Root is one of the biggest engineering and construction companies in America. And uh, it's now called KBR. Hmm. It's Kellogg Brown and Root. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I was talking to the CEO, Herb Friendsley was his name. And I, I said, well, Herb, how's it going? He said, welcome, it's going fine if I could just solve this cash flow problem at Brown and Root. And I said, what do you mean? Brown and Root doesn't have a cash flow problem. I have a cash flow problem. And he said, welcome, it takes $750,000 a day to operate Brown and Brew. And I've got to raise that cash every day. And uh, for a a week, I felt better (laughs) only having to raise $20,000 a day. Uh, Apparently, regardless of how big you get, you still have to work with cash flow. One of the reasons that we we concentrate on what we do is because of cash flow. For example, right now, we do only single and tenant industrial buildings. Okay. Okay, we have 4 million square feet, as you mentioned, uh, in 87 locations in Texas, most of them in Houston. But how did? Oh, go ahead. I was gonna. I just wanted to know how did that help with cash flow? That seems like that a single tenant situation sounds like that would be, that would not help with cash flow, as much as a multi tenant situation would be. Wrong. Okay. I'm yeah yeah you. I'm here to learn. Uh, let me tell you. I uh, see. I did shopping centers. Yes. Uh, I did uh, apartment projects. I did hotels. See, the hotel in the hotel business, your leases are one day at a time. Right. One time. Uh, in the apartment business, you open and you have rent, rented nothing. So you're scrambling. We used to, in Houston, we had what we call the army of occupation. And that is. Uh, it was a bunch of airline stewardesses who would move into your apartment project so you could meet, meet the occupancy required by the lender, the army of occupation. <laughs> anyway, single tenant industrial buildings. Sometimes we have a 10 year lease, sometimes a five, six year lease. So, uh, and the building was was designed specifically for what they needed. Uh, we did a lot of builder suits. We still mm-hmm. do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have a twenty five million dollar builder suit going on right now, mm. where a German company, when we finish construction, is going to lease at a high figure a facility uh, west of Houston in the suburbs of, of Houston, in Katy, Texas. And uh, and the point is, their credit is good. 
they're successful in business. And we have them on a, a 12 year lease. So, for example, in the, of our 4 million square feet uh, today, we're 96% occupied. Uh, on a multi tenant deal, you, know, you have shorter leases and you always have cash flow problems. Got it. So, if I hear you correctly, what you're saying is that the stability of the long term tenant uh, and a number of them solves the cash flow problem. Yes. Got it. And the if you can secure the right type of credit tenant for, obviously, in this case, uh, longer than a year, but multiple years, and in this case, decades, uh, you can reliably build <laughs> with less stress is what I'm hearing as well. Yes. Now, it takes more capital, uh, but thanks to the early days, we have more capital now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's nothing like success to bring, to attract capital. Correct. Got it. Totally understood. So, let me ask this question. Um, the industrial world is something that currently is is very foreign to me. Uh, is there something particular about industrial buildings that attracted you in the beginning? Like why, why those? I mean, you it, you've built all kinds of things, like you said, apartments and, and hotels and, and and everything, but you settled on industrial. Let me tell you, I developed three office buildings downtown. Mm-hmm. Two of them are 22 stories. Wow. In downtown Houston. Uh, so we've done everything, including hotels. The Marriott Corporation has 7,000 hotels in the world today. When they had five hotels, I developed number six. <laughs> in Houston, Texas, out by the Astrodome. Uh, but <clears throat> back to industrial, we were in the office building business, and uh, a broker brought us 15 industrial buildings. So w- we were, we contracted to, we offered, made an offer to buy the 15 buildings and the owner said you have to develop you have to buy my construction company as well my development company Hmm. the name of the company was gsl gustav s levy gsl that was the the owner's name Hmm. was gustav levy so I said, well, what do you want for the company? He said, well, a million dollars. I said, well, what assets does it have? And he says, well, it owns a Xerox machine, but it doesn't work. (laughs) He said, but we have goodwill. Mm. Right. And he had three or four Mm. buildings under construction. And, uh, So I first went to uh, and got somebody else to buy the the business, which I wasn't interested in, so that we could buy the three, the 15 buildings. Then one morning at at 4 a.m., the Xerox machine at my house went off, and it was a letter from him canceling the deal. What? So I... Called him up the next day and went over to see him. And he said, I don't like who you're selling the company to. I want you to buy the company. <laughs> so uh, we negotiated for a day or so. And I said, here's what I'll do. Instead of paying you a million dollars for the development company, I'll pay you a million two. But the promissory note is, is going to say it's payable only out of profits of the development company. He said, I'll do that in a heartbeat. Hmm. So that got us into the industrial development business. 
And uh, we've been in it, that was 25 years ago. We've been in it ever since. I find that interesting considering, I, well, that it wasn't even something you were in. It sounds like you didn't even want to be in. No. And, and, and at the time we had a couple of subdivisions uh, in Houston and other things we were working on. And, uh, and over time, we stopped doing everything else, and now we do only single tenant industrial building. When I say industrial, I don't mean warehouses. I mean manufacturing plants, expensive construction. Yeah. For example, uh, <clears throat> our buildings have many cranes. They have extra electric power. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the shop is air conditioned. Hmm. And a warehouse costs about $45 a foot to build. Our buildings are well over $100 a foot. Wow. So, And you found it beneficial enough to actually stay in the business. What what was it that kept your attention? I mean, I see that you you get into the, the business not necessarily looking for it, but you chose to stay. There was a conscious choice there. Well, the... The minute we saw that the cash flow <laughs> problem was solved. Got it. That's when we stopped doing everything else we were doing because we had long term leases. Got it. And with adequate credit on the lease, the uh, all you do is sit back and, and uh, collect checks every month. We don't change light bulbs. We don't. Uh, we don't mow the grass. <laughs> I triple net leases, and all we do is pay the ad valorem taxes, mm -hmm. which the tenant furnishes us the money to do that. Pay the insurance, and then again, the tenant furnishes the money for that. the taxes and insurance, and we, do, we were responsible for structural repairs. For example, the roof and the foundation. Yeah, totally understood. Man, you have done quite a, a number of things. Uh, as we wind down here, let me ask you this question. I'm curious to know, why is it important to you, you know, to even come on shows like this why Why take the time to do it? Well, I've written a book, and uh, it's the name of the book is called Always Welcome. Nine decades of good friends, good partners, and mostly good deals. <laughs> mostly good deals. I like that. And uh, the book has been is highly recommended. It has a five star rating on Amazon. It's available on Amazon. Always welcome by Welcome W. Wilson Sr. It's awesome, sir. I, I definitely appreciate the you taking the time to the, tell the stories and share uh, because there are lessons in um, that we all get a chance to learn, and if you weren't willing to share them, they would they could be lost. But now, you know, you, you've taken the time here, you've put it in the book and everybody knows how to get over to Amazon for sure and, and pick up a copy. Um, and I just want to be the first to thank you for taking the time to share your knowledge, your wisdom and your insight here with us today at the Cashflow Diary. You bet. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means get over to Amazon. Get a copy of Always Welcome, because you just heard from Welcome Wilson Sr. And it's not often that we get to hear from such a seasoned individual. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that you have the guts and the determination. So now it's time to go out there and do it. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. 